Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be, to be back in Egypt. I think, uh, you know, uh, unlike the previous uh, lectures where there's a lot of uh, papers to show and data, this one, unfortunately, there's a lot uh, that we don't know about this topic. Uh, so what I would like uh, to spend a few minutes on, uh, before I start, how many uh, people uh, have patients who ask them how much water they should drink? Okay. Uh, how much salt they should eat? So those are two common questions, and unfortunately, when you try to actually find the answer, it's not very easy to find. But let's spend a few minutes. How much water is normal? And is water really helpful? Everybody has water in front of it. Is that actually helpful in, in any way? Uh, and what is the role of water in disease? And I want to show you some very interesting data on uh, how our body actually handles water and finish the talk about uh, salt restriction, whether it actually is helpful in, uh, in chronic kidney disease. So this has become uh, a really major issue, at least in the United States. I'm just going to give you two or three stories. This is a, a woman, a uh, 28-year-old woman, who wanted, competed in a radio station because she wanted to win a video game for her son. Uh, and she was asked to drink six liters over three hours, uh, and she, she couldn't go to the bathroom. That was part of the... Uh, and she actually had seizures and died. Uh, and this story became very public, uh, and it brought to attention uh, uh, issues surrounding water. But this is the woman who died from drinking water. Uh, this is another 21-year-old uh, uh, who, when he joined college, uh, one of the ways he could join uh, the, uh, the group or the house where he lived in, he has to drink 20 liters uh, of water while doing push-ups, and he unfortunately also died uh, from hyponatremia. Those two stories, uh, they're 13 years old now, uh, but I can't tell you how much publicity they got, and it made people uh, think about the issue of water a little bit more, and I'll show you how that evolved. Uh, so uh, the, the other common thing uh, is hyponatremia in endurance sports. Uh, one out of six people who run marathons actually develop sodium of less than 120. <clears throat> and now, uh, any marathons, uh, uh, they should have, or they do have 23% normal saline uh, with the emergency medics. Anyone who seizes or had a seizure during a marathon, the first thing to do is give them 23% saline because of how common this issue is. So where did it come from? Uh, how many people are familiar with you have to drink eight ounces eight times a day? How many people have heard this? Eight glasses eight times a day. So this is very common. This is actually what people believe that you should drink. So if you do eight ounces eight times a day, that's 1,600 ml. And if you add water from food and coffee, uh, brings the average intake of liquid uh, in the developed world at least three liters. So where does this recommendation come from? And believe it or not, this is what doctors tell their patients, that you should drink this much water. So where does it come from? We actually don't know. Uh, the best guess is this woman, Jane Brody, who uh, she writes the science section uh, in the New York Times on Tuesday. And she came up with this idea, this is how much people should drink. So it came from no science, it came from uh, no place, uh, but Jane Brody uh, really uh, propagated this idea. So let me just uh, take you through some statistics. Uh, the average person drinks 100 liters per year. Uh, the water industry uh, is around $11 billion a year, which is kind of almost a budget of small country. This is how much. But this is what people don't realize. when you. Uh, drink a gallon of water from, you know, from the faucet, it costs around 0.1 cent. A bottle of water, the one you have in front of you, is 10,000 times more expensive than the water you drink from the faucet. Why is that important? Well, believe it or not, 40% of the water you drink while it comes in bottle actually comes from uh, the regular uh, place. Uh, nobody's filtering it and you know, you see it coming down, shalal, none of this happens. 50% of it 
is actually uh, so why do people drink so much and so this is uh, this is the most common answer people give that water flushes your system I don't know what that means but there's studies on this uh, that people think that increased water improves kidney function and removes toxins well Interestingly, if you actually load people with water acutely, it actually reduces your GFR. It does not increase your GFR. Now, chronic, if you were to drink three, five liters a day uh, for six months, your GFR remains the same. Now, it is clear, however, that it may increase sodium and urea clearance by drinking a lot of water, but neither sodium nor urea is a toxin. So this notion that drinking water improves the ability of the kidney uh, to remove toxin is totally false. This is the second one. How many people have, uh, they, you know, people who try to lose weight drink a lot of water? And the idea behind it, the more water you drink, the less food you eat. Well, there's been a lot of studies on this. And what happens with drinking so much water with food, you actually, your caloric intake does go down by 10% per meal. But what happens at the end of the day, you actually catch up. And there's been absolutely no evidence that drinking too much water uh, it reduces weight. So that's another reason uh, people use it. This is probably the most common reason, at least in the United States, for drinking water. And uh, strangely enough, women are the ones who believe in this the most is that water improves your skin makes your skin better well it is true dehydration does lead to loss of skin turgor and there's been quite a few studies where you actually look at uh, capillary flow in the skin to see if water ingestion actually improves skin nature uh, and those studies have been negative so there's no uh, reason to believe that drinking water actually improves uh, skin. Uh, the last one, I'm, I'm just giving you the kind of the social aspects of water before we get to the disease. Uh, how many times somebody has a headache, the first thing you do is, is give them a water, right? You know, if your head hurts, somebody hands you a water. Well, it turns out there's actually randomized control trials in acute migraine uh, where people randomized to water versus no water and see if there's actually a significant difference in improvement in headache and the answer is negative. So giving people with headaches water doesn't help. So, so where, where do we stand? Again, those are issues in normal people. We're not talking about people with kidney disease. So the Institute of Medicine, believe it or not, this was a three-day session uh, with experts in nephrology, social work, endocrinology to decide how much water people should drink. And the answer is, water intake should be guided by thirst. There's no reason for to drink more water other than when you're thirsty. Jane Brody of the New York Times, who started this whole thing, uh, she actually came out and said she was wrong and people shouldn't drink eight glasses of water a day. So at least she, she apologized for it. But the people who benefited from this uh, is companies that make bottled water. Prior to the Jane Brody saying this, uh, the bottled water industry was less than a billion dollars. Now it's over $50 billion just because of, uh, of this concept. So a lot of people made money from it, but there's no benefit. But let me take you to the medical aspects of this, which is what we care about uh, with our patients. So perhaps the, the most important paper that really uh, brought this to attention, this is from 20 years ago, where it actually showed that fluid intake reduces the risk of bladder cancer. And in, in this study at least, uh, if you, I don't know if I have a pointer, but if you look at the far right, uh, people who uh, in the uh, quintile, the fifth quintile of, of drinking more than two and a half liters of water a day uh, was associated with 49% lesser chance of bladder cancer. So this, uh, for the National Cancer Institute, became actually a recommendation, uh, but this was 20 years ago. And how it does it is, you know, basically it reduces or dilutes the toxins in the bladder 
but bladder cancer is not a very common cancer, but certainly this is one of the papers that people quote often. Now, this paper has, <clears throat> since then, as I showed you, this was 1999, there's been at least 15 papers now uh, looking at dietary water intake and risk of cancer, bladder cancer, other cancers, and they all have been negative. So there's absolutely no link uh, associating higher water intake uh, and less cancer. Now, more specifically, I want to show you the data we have on kidney disease and transplantation, how much water should actually people uh, drink. Uh, this is from our group in, before I moved from Minnesota looking uh, at uh, people who dialyze Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday to see if the days they go without dialysis for two days was associated with higher mortality. Uh, and what you see here, uh, is on the left panel, so this is, these are days of the week, and when people go two days without dialysis, uh, that's the highest mortality for dialysis patients. So the highest mortality is on Monday and Tuesday, which are the two days uh, after dialysis, and the biggest predictor of this mortality was uh, how much weight they gained, how much water they drank. So there's no question excessive water intake in the setting of dialysis is actually bad for you. You know, when we published this paper, I, you know, one of the reviewers said, well, most of the deaths happen on Monday and Tuesday. Well, how do you know that other people don't die more often on Monday and Tuesday, which turns out to be true? Most deaths happen on Monday and Tuesday. So we had to go through separate analysis to show that the deaths that are happening on Monday and Tuesday are separate from uh, the general population and they're related to fluid intake. So this is, this is the paper from a Canadian group. Uh, and again, this is the patient you're seeing in clinic, has a GFR 45, and ask you, well, how much water should I drink? Is that good for my kidney? Does it slow the progression of kidney disease? Uh, and this is uh, looking at 2,000 uh, patients and they collected, uh, it, it, it was an observational study, they were part of some other study called the Walkerton Health Study, where they collected urine at year one and uh, five and seven, and basically when you collect urine, it gives you a sense how much people are drinking, and they have serial GFR measured, and this is what it showed, that people who drank more than three liters a day, these are people with GFR 15 to 60, People who drank more than three liters a day uh, had lesser decline in kidney function. But again, this is an observational study, and there's a lot of reasons uh, to, to think this might not be a, a true association. So, but again, you could see uh, people who drank more than three liters, uh, they had lesser chance of uh, renal decline. Uh, it actually, the difference in GFR was almost three millimeters slower if you drank water. Now, this is an observational study and it really uh, is not very helpful. So this paper just uh, uh, came out a couple of years ago. So the same group actually did a randomized trial uh, of a chronic kidney disease patient who was ran randomized to two different levels of water intake. Uh, I want to point out a couple of things. So if you look at the top, they started with 2,390 patients and they ended up randomizing 631. So even a trial as simple as drinking two liters of water versus three liters of water, you still can't get people to participate. So you're not giving them any medications. It just shows you how difficult clinical trials are. At any rate, 315 uh, were randomized to each group. Uh, mean age was 64, uh, ethnicity 88% were white, uh, and their daily fluid intake at the bottom, were, they were drinking two liters when they came into the study, okay? So coming into the study, they were drinking two liters. Uh, hypertension and, and diabetes were the most common, typical of North uh, American uh, patient mix. 15% uh, of patients had more than 300 milligrams of proteinuria. Uh, and 17% uh, had 
more than 300 milligrams of albumin. So uh, somewhat representative of the patients we see, uh, and you can see the, the, the GFR uh, as well. Uh, again, this is just shows you uh, a lot of them are hypertensive, they have peripheral disease, 6% had uh, congestive heart failure. Again, the whole idea of these tables is to show you that these patients who were studied were actually similar to the one uh, you and I see in clinic. Uh, and they did a lot of measurements. I'm just going to show you the main uh, finding. So if you look at urine volume, uh, before the random is in the one point liter, so they were able to increase it in the hydration group to two and a half liters. The control group remained at 1.9, uh, and uh, so, they, so basically two liters versus three liters uh, of water intake, and this is the change. Uh, there was absolutely no change in uh, how quickly you lose GFR. So I think this, trial, this is the first time, believe it or not, anybody has done this. So I think the answer when patients ask how much water they should drink, you just drink when you're thirsty. More is not better, less is not good. Uh, but we finally have an answer to this. Um, again, this is just shows you their GFR before and after. They started at 52. By the end of the 12 months, it was 53. Uh, really no change. I think this is uh, another important question. So it doesn't seem that excessive water helps if you're healthy. You just drink when you're thirsty. It doesn't seem to be helpful if you have chronic kidney disease. So how about if you have a kidney transplant, uh, which is, I, I'm sure people who do transplants uh, always tell their fluid to drink a lot. So we actually looked at this. This is a paper we published a few years ago. And basically what we wanted to do, uh, these are kidney transplant recipients we followed for five years, and we knew exactly what their water intake for five years. And this is, uh, it shows you at the bottom, this is up to six years. And it, it, you know, the average uh, urine volume in transplant recipients are two liters. So these are people we didn't ask them to drink. They just drank what they wanted. But we wanted to compare people with the highest water intake to the lowest water intake. And what we found, this is a really busy slide, uh, but people with higher urine volume actually had more interstitial fibrosis and their kidney biopsy that we did at baseline in five years after adjustments for uh, all these factors. So it does appear that excessive water intake, which makes sense if you think about it, if you have limited number of nephrons, why do you want them to work too hard? I mean, I think you should just let them rest as much as you can. Uh, so water intake and transplant, again, there's no reason to recommend uh, increasing water intake beyond what people uh, drink. Let me show you my thoughts on uh, salt because I think this is another area uh, that I think all of us just learn it, that salt is bad for you, bad for the kidney disease. I actually have a different uh, position on it and I just want to share with you how I feel about it and show you some of the data. So salt is really interesting. Uh, actually salt uh, has always been regarded as a symbol of wealth. Uh, actually, when you say salute in, in Spanish or other, it actually comes from the word uh, salt. You know, in, in, in previous uh, eras, actually soldiers never got money. What they got uh, is salt for salary. And actually that's where the word salary comes from, is from salt. So if you were a high-ranking official, you get two pounds of salt. If you're a regular person, you get half a pound of salt. But the, the word salary comes from salt because that's what people received uh, for wages. So just to make sure we're on the same page, because uh, people use salt and sodium, uh, you know, the average diet is, is around 100 milli equivalents of sodium. Probably in, middle, in the Middle East is probably double that. I suspect it's around 200, 250 milli equivalents. Uh, the most interesting is European countries. Uh, so while salt intake in the West is around two, three grams a day, uh, the European Union uh, put out the paper on the average salt intake in European countries. In Poland, it's 19 grams a day. 
compared to two grams a day. So uh, there's a, a lot of countries with, uh, and uh, the biggest uh, source of salt, uh, believe it or not, is bread. So if you, you want to remove 50, 70 percent of your salt intake, just stop eating bread. The reason salt is added is bre to bread uh, is that's what makes bread have consistency. So if you take salt out of bread, and the reason uh, that taking salt out of food in the United States will never happen because how powerful the bread-making uh, lobby is. They would lobby Congress against it. They will never take it out because otherwise they can't sell their bread, which is really interesting. Uh, so, and this is another thing. So, appetite for salt actually have the same uh, neuronal uh, pathway as cocaine addiction. So if you take a rat and give him cocaine and look what, what area of the brain is stimulated, it's the same area that is stimulated by salt intake. So there's something addicting about uh, salt. So let me show you some of the data that argues that salt and restriction is actually good for you. So this is a paper looking at uh, urine sodium uh, and uh, long-term survival in chronic kidney disease. Uh, so these are patients uh, with uh, different stages of chronic kidney disease. And you can see the mean, urine, uh, the mean urine sodium, which reflects the usual daily intake, is around 100. And if you adjust it by creatinine, you can see that uh, a lot of stage 5 patients are actually uh, consume more sodium uh, than earlier stages of kidney disease. And this is the short answer. Uh, chronic kidney disease patients who actually have uh, lower sodium intake are at least four times more likely to die compared to uh, pati uh, patients with normal sodium intake. So this, this paper didn't receive the attention it should while it was actually a, a published in the American Heart Association, <clears throat> but very little doubt exists that in chronic kidney disease, non-dialysis dependent, salt restriction is actually associated with higher mortality. And you could see this, so uh, this is the cumulative hazard of death, the group with the lowest salt intake, 30% uh, of them died at 12 years, compared to the uh, highest uh, sodium intake where it was 10 percent. So high sodium intake, uh, low sodium intake seems to be actually harmful in the setting of chronic uh, kidney disease. Well, if you don't believe that one, uh, there's a paper, uh, this is a great uh, cohort study from uh, the Flemish study on genes, which is a prospective study of uh, 3,600 patients, and uh, 2,000 of these patients are normal at baseline. They have no cardiac disease. And the median follow-up of 7.9 years. Urine sodium was measured as reflection of food intake uh, and to see what happened to them. And it's the same exact thing. Patients with low sodium intake were actually more likely to die. And if you look at on the right, uh, high sodium intake uh, actually has the least number of cardiac events. Now, if, you, if you're one of those who believe, uh, again, this is showing uh, the mortality and cardiac event, and the top line uh, are people with low salt intake, the lowest line is the high salt intake, less mortality uh, and less cardiovascular disease. So if, you, if you're one of those who believes actually that salt increases the risk of hypertension, this is from the same paper, remember, 2,000 of these people were followed for 10 years, and then looked at the incidence of developing hypertension. There was absolutely no difference in your chance of developing hypertension, whether you took high sodium or low sodium. Uh, so I think it's one of those we always, you know, quote and think that salt is bad, but I don't think that the story is uh, completely out there. Uh, and p for people who like the Cochrane meta-analysis, uh, so this uh, looked at every randomized trial ever done where the in intervention uh, is low salt. Uh, there were 60, uh, almost uh, uh, 7,000 patients. 3,500 of them were normal tensive. And you could look at this slide, no matter how you look at it, 
Low salt was not associated with less hypertension. Low salt was not associated with better outcomes. Uh, in fact, as I showed you in two studies, uh, mortality was higher with salt restriction. So is there anything good about sodium restriction? Well, there is. Let me show you what, why it may be helpful in some people. If you eat a diet that's unrestricted in sodium versus restricted, look at your calorie intake. With lower sodium intake, uh, you're, you're eating 300 less calories a day because you're not eating the bread, you're not eating the things that have high salt. And you could go down through the list. Uh, a sodium-restricted diet tend to be uh, less calories, less saturated fats. So studies, when they look at low sodium, they're not actually accounting for the fact that low sodium intake has other benefits uh, that cannot be adjusted for unless you do a randomized trial. So I'm going to finish. I think I have a minute, tells me. Um, I think this is probably the most controversial, which is when you eat salty food, uh, this is this is how we behave and this is what we teach people, is that you immediately drink water so you can reduce your osmolality. Does everybody agree eating salt makes you drink more water? Well, let me show you. It turns out I'm going to show you this paper. This is probably one of the most influential, I think, papers in medicine that just came out last year by Jens Titz, who actually is the, kind of the, one of the most influential world on how we understand sodium. And this is what we did. They, they took people who uh, actually uh, were in a unit that they cannot leave and randomized them. This is part of the space program at NASA in Houston. And they randomized people to eating 12 grams of sodium, 9 grams, uh, or low sodium diets. And the question is, does eating a lot of sodium actually make you drink more water or not? So these people can, could not leave, so they're monitored. We know exactly how, uh, how, what, what they behave. And what the answer is, none of the people on the high sodium diet actually drank more water. What happens with drinking more water, actually, you reduce your urine volume. And the way you do that is by creating water. Uh, you make more water internally. And the way you do that is by changes in the mineralocorticoid and the glucocorticoid receptors activity. And contrary to what we think, where you think cortisol just goes up in the morning or aldosterone goes up when you, you're hypo... Can I get some time? Can I two, advise two minutes, please. One minute. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, the summary of this is actually uh, long-term high salt intake does not increase water consumption. And I know it sounds so contradictory to what we learn, uh, but these studies actually uh, show us a different way of how we deal with uh, increased salt intake. It's actually a reduction in urine volume rather than drinking uh, water. Uh, so I think short of a, a long-term randomized trial, we will never have an answer whether uh, salt is, is good or bad for you. My sense, it's not, it's, salt restriction is really uh, not a good idea. I didn't show you the salt restriction in diabetics. There's a paper in JAMA and one in diabetes care showing higher mortality with salt restrictions uh, in diabetics. I think salt restriction may be helpful uh, because of the things that come with it. Less calories, less salt, and I think liberal water intake is obviously helpful in kidney stones. Uh, I don't think it has any benefit in cancer, and now we know it's not helpful in chronic kidney disease, and it's not helpful in the setting of kidney transplantation. Thank you.